In this section, we're going to use Kubernetes for the first time seriously. And we're going to start with pods. And a pod is the most basic concept in Kubernetes. We're going to be talking all the way through this course about pods. Pods are so simple and so basic to Kubernetes that they're almost difficult to explain. So I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm on the Kubernetes uh, website on the page covering pods, and they open with what is a pod. And they talk about a pod here as being a group of one or more containers, such as Docker containers. Remember, you can use Kubernetes in non-Docker environments. But we're using Docker. And apparently they have shared storage network and a specification for how to run the containers. Hmm. Well, what does all that stuff really mean? Let's think about the work we're planning to do on this course. Our job is to deploy a microservice architecture to the cloud. I talked a little bit about this earlier on in the course. Remember that we have a series of microservices and possibly web containers. And the developers have already packaged each microservice into a Docker image. Now, of course, we could manage the deployments of this ourselves. We could fire up a node in a cloud system like Amazon Web Services. We could log on to a node and then we could start running Docker command lines. So I could do for this one Docker container run with the name of the image. And then I could go ahead and do all of the other microservices and this web container. Now, as I said in the introduction, for a real system, managing that architecture is going to be far too much work. So we're going to use Kubernetes to orchestrate this system. So Kubernetes is going to be responsible for managing the starting and stopping of these containers. Now, to define the architecture, Kubernetes has a lot of concepts, such as replica sets, services, stateful sets, and it goes on. We'll be covering all those concepts through this course. But its most basic concept is a pod. And to put this simply, for every container that we're planning to deploy, we're going to create a pod in Kubernetes. And you can think of each of these pods as just being a wrapper for a container. So every one of these microservices is going to become a pod in its own right. For most situations, you're going to find that a pod and a container are in a one-to-one -one relationship. So you might be wondering why have Kubernetes gone to the bother of creating some extra jargon here? Well, there's two things to say about that. It is perfectly possible to have more than one container inside a pod, as I'm trying to illustrate here. So I have some kind of a microservice doing some work. Well, I don't have a specific reason for doing this, but perhaps it's possible that this microservice needs some kind of a help from a second container. A common example that's given at this stage is perhaps we want to gather the logs from this microservice and we want to process those logs in some way, but we don't want the processing of the logs to happen inside the microservice. So we'll have a second container doing this kind of secondary function. Now, I'm struggling a little bit there for the reason that in all the time I've been working with Kubernetes, I've almost always, a few very minor exceptions, I've almost always deployed one container to a pod. You will see later on in this course, when we work with MongoDB, that there is a pre-configured MongoDB configuration. And they do use these helper containers. In fact, they call them sidecar containers. I would think of it as a fairly rare occurrence that you need to do that. What you definitely would never do is have two microservices inside a pod. That just wouldn't make sense at all. Definitely think of each pod as implementing a single service. And in some very rare cases, very rare, you might have one of these helper or sidecar containers. Just so that you're aware that you can have more than one container in a pod, but also so you're aware that it's not even an advanced technique. It's just something that 
you would only do in very specialist circumstances. For us, we're going to get a lot of mileage from simply deploying a container in each pod. We need to go away and we need to create some of these pods for Kubernetes to work with. And what Kubernetes is going to do with these pods is it's going to manage those pods. And by that, I mean it's going to do things like making sure they're running all the time. They're going to, Kubernetes will make sure that a pod isn't using too much disk or CPU and so on. So a pod in Kubernetes is just the most basic unit of deployment. So let's write our first pod together. Now, over the next few sections of this course, we're going to be building up the architecture slowly. And for now, we're going to keep things as basic as possible. We have a single image here on Docker Hub, Kubernetes Fleetman Web App Angular. I'm sorry about the long name there. I could have kept it shorter, but I need to distinguish it from other images that I've created for other courses. So we need to deploy this image and we want Kubernetes to manage it. So we're going to need to create a pod for it. Now we're going to start with the image which is tagged release zero. This is a very basic prototype of the system. It's really ugly looking web page. You can think of it as just really the first attempt by the web developers to show a map for tracking our vehicles. So how do we make a pod that's going to deploy this image? By the way, I do invite you to read the user guide on pods because they talk about, if I just go to alternatives considered, they're quite good at talking about the, the, the reasons they made the decision to have the concept of a pod in Kubernetes. Um, I mean, if you think about it, they could have just called these things containers and be done with it. But um, they also give an example here of why you might have two containers inside a single pod. They give an example of how you might have a web server container and you need a helper container, which is a file puller. Not entirely sure what that is, but they're arguing that these two containers would never stand alone. They would never need to work independently of each other. So in that case, it might make it, it might make sense to pull them together into a single pod. Perfectly valid, depends on your architecture. But for me, I would make the file puller be a microservice in its own right, and the web server a completely se separate microservice. It's not really a microservice, but a separate service, and I'd network the two together. But anyway, more on that later. You might be interested in reading that, but all the way down at the bottom here is it's a little bit vague, this, but this API object is in fact telling us how we can create a pod. And if we follow the link here, this is a really important document. We're going to be referring to it throughout the course. This document shows us how to write the scripts that we need for Kubernetes. Now, it's a little bit awkward, this. The link I've just followed, this link here, can you see there's a version number in there? That's going to change over time. So I'm not going to give you this link directly. But if you follow the link to kubernetes.io forward slash docs, forward slash reference, and I've done a URL shortener on that here, then you can always follow the link under API reference to whatever version of Kubernetes you're using, and it will be the latest. So at the time I'm recording the course, it's version 1.10. If you follow that link, it will bring you back to here. Now, this is such an important document. Now, we were on the page for pods, but I've lost that page. So I'll you can find the link on the left hand side here for pod version one core. Now this is telling us exactly how we can define a pod using a file. So we've got the manual. I think in the next video, we'll have a go at writing our first pod.